ร้างเศรษฐกิจคนเศรษฐศาสตร์โดยคณะเศรษฐศาสตร์จุฬาลงกรณ์มหาวิทยาลัยสวัสดีครับท่านผู้ฟังยินดีต้อนรับเข้าสู่รายการพินิษเศรษฐกิจการเมืองในช่วงที่สองช่วงคลังเศรษฐกิจคนเศรษฐศาสตร์ของคณะเศรษฐศาสตร์จุฬาลงกรณ์มหาวิทยาลัยวันนี้ผมต่อพัดยมนาเป็นผู้ดำเนินรายการนะครับผมอยู่กับ Professor Matthew Stephenson ซึ่งเป็น Eli Goldstein Professor of Law ที่ Harvard Law School Professor Stephenson มีความสนใจในการทำวิจัยเรื่องคอร์รัปชันและการต่อต้านคอร์รัปชันมากอาจารย์เป็นผู้ก่อตั้ง Global Anti Corruption Lab ซึ่งเป็นวิชาหนึ่งที่นิสิตนักศึกษาที่มหาวิทยาลัย Harvard สามารถเลือกเรียนได้นะครับแล้วเป็นเรื่องที่เกี่ยวข้องกับเรื่องคอร์รัปชันด้วยนอกจากนี้ยังเป็นเจ้าของบล็อก Global Anti Corruption Blog ซึ่งเป็นบล็อกที่นักวิชาการโดยเฉพาะผู้ที่สนใจในเรื่องคอร์รัปชันและทำอภิบาลเนี่ยให้ความสนใจแล้วอยากจะมาตีพิมพ์ในบล็อกนี้มากๆเลยเนี่ยนะครับแล้วก็มีเรื่องราวความรู้หลากหลายมาก Professor Matthew Stephenson ให้เกียรติมาร่วมทำงานวิจัยกับอาจารย์และนิสิตนักศึกนิสิตนักศึกษาที่จุฬาลงกรณ์มหาวิทยาลัยนะครับและอาจารย์ได้เดินทางมาอยู่ที่เมืองไทยในช่วงเดือนมกราประมาณสามสัปดาห์ในช่วงนี้ผมได้มีโอกาสร่วมคุยงานแล้วก็ทํางานกับอาจารย์ด้วยแล้วก็เลยได้คุยกันว่าเป็นช่วงที่องค์กรที่ชื่อว่า Transparency International หรือองค์กรเพื่อความโปร่งใสสากลเนี่ยเปิดเผยดัชนี Corruption Perception Index หรือดัชนีภาพลักษณ์คอร์รัปชันซึ่งเป็นดัชนีที่คนให้ความสนใจทั่วโลกเลยนะครับแล้วก็ชี้ให้เห็นว่าที่ผ่านมาประเทศไทยดูเหมือนไม่ค่อยจะทำคะแนนได้ดีสักเท่าไหร่และไม่ค่อยสามารถพัฒนาเรื่องนี้มาได้ด้วยดัชนีนี้มีการถกเถียงกันมากบางคนก็บอกโอ้โหเป็นสิ่งที่ต้องใช้เป็นเป้าหมายหลักเลยนะทั้งรัฐบาลปปชเนี่ยตั้งเป็นเป้าหมายของประเทศเลยว่าจะต้องไปให้ถึงคะแนนที่50คะแนนได้ในขณะที่ทุกวันนี้เรายังอยู่ประมาณ34 35 36สูงสุดเป็น38อะไรเงี้ยนะครับเต็มร้อยอย่างไรก็ตามนักวิชาการกลุ่มหนึ่งบอกว่าเอ้ยแต่มันเป็นเรื่องการวัดภาพลักษณ์นะมันไม่สะท้อนภาพความเป็นจริงทั้งหมดหรอกแล้วมันมีปัญหาอีกมากมายวันนี้เราได้อยู่กับ professor Matthew Stephenson แล้วนะครับอาจารย์ได้อธิบายในรายละเอียดเชิงลึกเลยว่าตัวดัชนีภาพลักษณ์การคอร์รัปชันหรือ corruption perception index ที่ย่อว่า CPI เนี่ยมันมีลักษณะเป็นอย่างไรมีข้อดีตรงที่สามารถสะท้อนให้เห็นได้จริงๆว่าประเทศเรากำลังมีปัญหาอยู่เยอะนะแต่ก็มีข้อจำกัดเช่นเดียวกันถ้าเราจะเอาไปวัดประสิทธิภาพการทำงานคงยากเพราะมันมีความหนืดในการขยับขับเคลื่อนนะฮะมันสะท้อนมาจากความเห็นของประชาชนและคนในสังคมทั้งในและต่างประเทศทั่วไปเนี่ยวันนี้เรามาทำความเข้าใจกันดีกว่าว่า CPI มันบอกอะไรเราได้บ้างในบทสัมภาษณ์ของผมกับ Professor Matthew Stephenson นะครับเชิญรับฟังได้เลยครับ What is CPI? Does it really uh, measure corruption in, in, in our country or anywhere around the world? So um, CPI uh, stands for the Corruption Perceptions Index. It's uh, an index published annually by Transparency International, which is the world's largest, one of the world's leading civil society organizations, specifically focused on the issue of corruption and anti-corruption. And um, The CPI, as the name itself indicates, is not a measure of corruption directly. And the people at Transparency International are actually pretty good at, at emphasizing this, uh, and we need to make sure we're clear about it. It's a measure of corruption perceptions. The way the CPI is compiled uh, is as follows. Transparency International actually does not itself generate the numbers. It doesn't have its own in-house experts who assess countries for their level of corruption. There are a variety of other indexes out there in the world, uh, some created by international organizations, uh, some that are created by private sector consulting groups that basically assess political risk for foreign investors, uh, and certain other entities as well that rank countries or rate countries based on a number of things, but is relevant here the Their level of, of uh, corruption, or the amount of corruption that the experts at these various organizations uh, believe is present in those countries, and what Transparency International does basically is it uses a particular method to put those different numbers on a common scale, 
right? Some of those indexes are zero to seven, some are one to 10. Transparency International basically just converts them into a common scale and averages them. Not a lot of super fancy stuff. There's a little bit of other things that they do to try to you know, calibrate scores from year to year, but basically it's a standardized and average technique. And of course, the other thing they do is publicize them, right? These, then they get a lot of attention. So uh, in terms of how much these things measure actual corruption, reality, again, the measures themselves are measures of perception. Perceptions are often related to reality, right? It would be, it would be worrisome if our perceptions of things com were completely different uh, from our measure of reality, right? If you ask people to just rank countries on a scale of one to 10 based on how prosperous you perceive them to be, and then compared those numbers to per capita gross domestic product measures, one would hope that those numbers would be correlated with each other, right? There might be some surprise. There might be some countries that people think of as kind of poor countries that actually have pretty high per capita incomes or some countries that, you know, people don't think of as that rich that actually do have pretty high per capita incomes. But mostly, if we ran the numbers, if we did the statistics, we'd expect those things to be correlated. And so, too, with uh, corruption, perceived corruption. The CPI is a measure of perceptions of corruption. And those perceptions, I believe, have some relationship, at least on average, with actual corruption, right? People, the fact that people consistently perceive corruption as being higher in um, Cambodia than in Sweden is probably an indication that corruption really is more prevalent in Cambodia than in Sweden. But very recently, the OECD just issued a report and uh, suggesting that we shouldn't be worried too much if we don't have uh, that high level of CPI. Is, is, is that something we should consider? So I have not gotten a chance to read the OECD's most recent report. I will refer to a report from the UN Office of Drugs and Crime that I co-authored with my, my friend and collaborator Rick Messick on national anti-corruption strategies, which had a brief section on the CPI and related measures. And what we emphasize, and what I would emphasize, is that these measures are useful for some things, but they are not good at measuring progress. And it is not a good idea to try to assess the success or failure of a country's anti-corruption efforts by changes in the CPI score. So when you say the OECD says, don't worry about your CPI score, there are different ways that one might interpret that. If the OECD says, don't worry if your CPI score is low because the CPI score doesn't really have anything to do with reality, I would take issue with that. I don't think that's right. But if, what if the OECD is saying is don't fixate on your CPI score or changes in your CPI score when trying to assess if your anti-corruption efforts are successful or appropriate, I would 100% agree with that. I think that's, that's both right and very important. How should we, as a, and in, if we are in, in uh, anti-corruption organization, how should we receive it? So let me, I can talk about something that I think would be a very good thing to come out of the latest CPI number and something that would be not such a good thing to come out of. Of course. I think that the best thing to come out of the annual publication of these CPI numbers is to focus attention on the issue and focus attention on the problem. And if, as I think you and I both expect, Thailand's score comes out and the score is not great, it's somewhere in the mid to high 30s, I think if that provokes news stories, public attention, et cetera, saying Thailand continues to have a serious corruption problem, we can't sweep this under the rug, this is really important, international experts are recognizing that our corruption situation is, is a serious one and we need to do something about it, um, and that prompts people to pay more attention to the issue, that would be a good thing. I think that would be a good thing. And being reminded that, you know, you have a mess in your house that you need to clean up, is that, that can be a good thing. What would be a bad thing in my view, or at least a, a bad might be overstating, an unproductive thing, a counterproductive thing, would be if too much of the attention focuses on whether the score went like up a point or two from last year or down a point or two from last year, or if you have stories saying, uh, oh, gosh, you know, the score went up, so therefore everything's great, or more likely the score didn't move, and therefore anti-corruption efforts are all in vain and nothing's working, or anything like that, I think would be um, unfortunate. Uh, it would be especially unfortunate if it, that leads to a kind of demoralization where people kind of start to give up and say, you know, no matter what we do, the CPI score never changes. Uh, it's, it's hopeless.
the, I, again, this is a theme we keep coming back to, so let me just say a little bit more, if I may, uh, if you'll indulge me. Some, the, the, some of the reasons that I keep repeating don't look to year-to-year changes in, this, in the uh, CPI score to assess whether your country is making progress or stalling or moving backwards. The CPI is really useful for some purposes, but as, it, as an indicator of corruption, not only is it, is it a perceptions indicator, not necessarily a reality indicator, it's... Um, it's a lagging indicator, it's a sticky indicator, and it's a noisy indicator. And let me just unpack each of those things. By a lagging indicator, I mean that perceptions typically don't change until sometime after a change in reality. Countries, like people, like companies, like other, other things, get reputations, and they can start to change and sometimes you don't see those changes start to show up in changes in these assessments or these scores until sometime uh, after that. It's, um, that's related to my second point, that it's, these are sticky indicators. What, by, what, what I mean by that is these things don't change very much, um, in part because reputations are sticky, partly because although Transparency International claims that it calibrates everything so everything's on a common scale, really the indexes that TI uses to generate the CPI, the, we have no guarantee those scales remain constant from year to year, so it may well be that you know, people's standard of what counts as more or less corruption changes, and that really there's just some implicit ranking. Are you more corrupt than corrupt country X, less corrupt than country Y? Um, and these things can be so sticky that even if they're quite substantial changes, uh, they might not show up in the CPI scores for, for quite a while. And by a noisy indicator, I mean there's just a lot of random error with respect to the CPI. They're not very precise, and relatively small changes in the underlying scores or whether particular, sp particular indexes are added or dropped because new ones are created and old ones become outdated can lead the scores to fluctuate a bit uh, or more than a bit. Um, even, so Transparency International, to its credit, includes, if you look hard enough on the website, but you have to dig a little bit, not just the number, but what they call the confidence interval. That we're like 90% sure that the score so falls somewhere between this point and this point, but like there's some noise. So that's good. But very often, media reports and Transparency International's own press releases play up as substantively meaningful score changes that don't meet Transparency International's criteria for statistical significance. That is, there's a very high probability that those uh, score changes could be due just to random noise. Moreover, when you look at a large enough number of countries, some of them will, even if the process is totally random, will show unusually large increases or decreases, right, even if there's nothing real happening. Now, in addition to those problems, there are a couple others that I, I want to mention that are related, but, but I think significant. Um, certain types of anti-corruption efforts, precisely because they expose corruption and raise the profile of corruption problems in a given country can maybe make the CPI score worse because people are paying attention to the problem, they're thinking about how big the problem is, even if one might think actually if anything the problem is getting better or progress is being made. My favorite example of this is Brazil a few years back uh, saw a worsening, a notable worsening of its score, right around the time when the so-called Lava Jato or car wash investigation had exposed massive corruption that had been going on for years and years principally at Brazil's state-owned oil company, Petrobras. So many people wonder, well, wait a second, if, if the Lava Jato investigation is finally blowing this open and arresting people and putting politicians and businessmen in jail, why is the score going down? And nobody knows, but I think it's quite plausible that because the Lava Jato investigation exposed that corruption in Brazil had been even worse for decades than people had thought, Brazil's score went down. But they didn't go back and retroactively change the scores for all the preceding years now that they knew how much corruption had been going on in those years. So there's an artificial decrease. The other thing is, well, what I'm about to say doesn't happen all that much. On a couple of occasions, I dug into what looked like quite notable score increases and realized they're entirely the result of particular indexes getting added or dropped to the ones that TI, that TI averages together. I, the first time I wrote on my blog about the TI index, I was focused particularly on China's score, and the story was that China's score had dropped 
and all of and TI had all these press releases like this shows that China's approach to anti-corruption is failing and so forth so forth. And to be clear, I'm not a big fan of China's very top-down authoritative authoritarian approach to anti-corruption. I'm not here to defend it. But when I looked at the underlying data, most of the decrease, not all of it, but most of the decrease was due to the fact that there was one index, a particular survey that had been run, on which China did unusually well. Like its score on that one was like anomalously high compared to its other scores, but it didn't get updated. And after four years, Transparency International drops indexes that are more than, I forget, three or four years old. It dropped the index, and that was a big part of lowering the score. I went back and recalculated what China's scores would have been in the previous years if that one had never been included. And the diff- I don't remember if the differences completely disappeared, but they were certainly much smaller. So um, I, I think that, again, the CPI has a great many uses. Politically, rhetorically, it's good at calling attention to the problem and provoking people to pay attention to it and take it seriously. It can be good for certain types of empirical research of the sort that you do and that your colleagues do in the economics department when you're analyzing what factors at the country level are associated with higher or lower levels of of corruption. I think we're doing kind of cross-sectional, cross-country data. The CPI, not perfect, but can be a, a sufficiently good indicator that it can be used for that kind of work. Maybe it can be used for kind of regional benchmarking um, if you want to get a sense at least, at least of how the world is perceiving you. And I should emphasize that perceptions matter in their own right. If you're talking about how foreign investors are perceiving your country, well, there maybe the perceptions matter independent of the reality, right? If you're perceived as a high-risk country, it may be more difficult, for example, to, to get foreign investment. However, if used to set performance targets if used to set progress, if used to write media articles about how like this country's doing a little bit better and this country's doing a little bit worse and all this stuff, that strikes me as um, bad scientifically and bad politically. It's bad scientifically because it can be kind of the equivalent of every year taking a country's score and you know flipping six coins and adding a point for every head and subtracting a point for every tail. And if, like, you happen to get a plus three, you write a big story about how the country's getting better. If you get a minus three, like, the country's getting away. That it's, it's ridiculous. It's bad politically, I do think, because it can, tr- can contribute to unrealistic expectations, demoralization, and a lack of attention to the development of more refined indicators that might actually be more useful in doing the kind of monitoring and assessment work that we really do need to do to figure out whether our assessments are having that, our interventions, excuse me, are having their intended effect. So um, in that sense, would you have anything um, uh, for the audience at this final moment? Yeah, yeah. I, the only thing I would take, everything you said, I, I mostly agree with the only thing I take issue with is not so much don't take it seriously. It's remember what it can be used for and what it can't be used for. Absolutely take it seriously as highlighting uh, a problem. That, that Thailand might have and that might need, need to be addressed, don't use it to measure things that it wasn't designed to measure. และนั่นคือบทสัมภาษณ์ของผมกับ Professor Matthew Stevenson นะครับที่คุยกันเรื่องดัชนีภาพลักษณ์การคอร์รัปชันและการที่องค์กรหน่วยงานหรือประชาชนไทยจะสามารถทำความเข้าใจกับดัชนีนี้ได้ว่ามันเป็นอย่างไรอย่างที่อาจารย์บอกไปข้อดีมันมีมันแสดงให้เห็นว่าตอนนี้ประเทศไทยเรามีปัญหาการคอร์รัปชันอยู่มากหรือน้อยแค่ไหนและปัญหานั้นอยู่ที่จุดไหนด้วยเพื่อที่การออกแบบมาตรการนโยบายและนวัตกรรมต่างๆจะได้มุ่งไปถูกจุดได้อย่างไรก็ตามข้อจํากัดของดัชนีภาพลักษณ์เช่นนี้ก็คือการที่บอกว่ามันมีความทั้งความล่าช้านะอาจารย์ใช้คำว่าแลกมีความหนืดนะครับก็คือขยับได้ยากกับขยับได้ช้านะครับแล้วก็มี noise ก็คือมีความมีเสียงรบกวนนะอาจจะทําให้ภาพไม่ได้สะท้อนความเป็นจริงเสมอเพราะฉะนั้นการที่จะไปวัดว่าปีนี้ประเทศไทยเพิ่มขึ้นหนึ่งหรือลดลงหนึ่งในดัชนีนี้ตัวเลขเพิ่มขึ้นลดลงอย่างไรเล็กๆน้อยๆเนี่ยอาจจะไม่สามารถช่วยให้เราเห็นภาพอะไรได้ดีขนาดนั้นนั่นคือข้อจํากัดนะครับแต่อย่างไรก็ตามถ้าจะปฏิเสธว่าประเทศไทยมีคอร์รัปชันที่แตกต่างจากทุกประเทศในโลกเพราะฉะนั้นเราไม่ต้องสนใจมันหรอกนะอันนี้ก็คงไม่ได้เพราะมันสะท้อนให้เห็นจริงๆว่าการคอร์รัปชันในประเทศไทยมันยังเป็นปัญหาที่ใหญ่และเป็นปัญหาสําคัญอยู่นะครับสําคัญต่อไปก็คือเราจะจัดการกับมันอย่างไรการแก้ไขปัญหานี้เราจะทําได้อย่างไรงานวิจัยของคณะเศรษฐศาสตร์จุฬาชี้ชัดว่าการสร้างความโปร่งใสและการมีส่วนร่วมของประชาชนเป็นสิ่งสําคัญมากเพราะฉะนั้นเราจะ
มุ่งพัฒนานโยบายมาตรการและนวัตกรรมใหม่ๆเพื่อสนับสนุนความโปร่งใสและการมีส่วนร่วมของประชาชนในสังคมได้อย่างไรอันนี้คือสิ่งสําคัญครับถ้าสนใจว่าเมื่อเรื่องนี้มันจะเป็นอย่างไรสามารถไปติดต่อไปตามผลงานทางวิชาการและผลงานในการปฏิบัติจริงของทีมวิจัยจากจุฬาลงกรณ์มหาวิทยาลัยได้ที่ Facebook สยามแ a บนะครับหรือติดตามการทำงานขององค์กรภาคีของเราที่ศูนย์ศึกษาเศรษฐศาสตร์การเมืองหรือว่า Ham Social Enterprise ได้วันนี้ผมต่อพัฒยมนาคและ Professor Matthew Stevenson ก็ต้องขอขอบคุณและสวัสดีท่านผู้ฟังไปเท่านี้ก่อนนะครับสวัสดีครับ